All right, I think everyone's in. Um, good afternoon or good morning, uh, depending on where you are, or good evening even, um, to the Hague program on uh, International Cybersecurity's uh, monthly seminar series. Um, I will keep it brief because we have, uh, uh, we have uh, quite enough speakers for you today. Um, um, unlike usually, usually we have a monograph, but this time we have an edited volume um, with uh, two returning authors, I would say. Uh, Max Smates and James Shires are two of the three editors uh, of, this, uh, of this book on cyberspace and instability. Um, a third editor is, uh, uh, is Chesney, um, who is not here, I think. Um, no, he's not. <clears throat> and um, they will give a brief introduction on the book uh, as a whole, sort of the framing, um, sort of what the idea behind convening these authors uh, around this specific topic of uh, stability and instability, which I think is a very good topic. Um, and then we'll have three of the chapter authors uh, uh, speaking to you um, in order. Uh, Fiona Cunningham, who is already here and on screen. Uh, Mark Raymond, who is uh, hopefully scrambling to get here uh, from uh, Oklahoma. And uh, Malin Fiddler, who will be a little bit late because of icy roads. And we just discussed that that's not an excuse that many of us can use, but I'm sure it's a valid excuse in, uh, in, her, uh, in her case. Um, so. Without uh, taking too much time, uh, I will just hand it over to Max Mates to uh, to sort of uh, kick off uh, um, uh, the framing, uh, and then uh, he can introduce the the, the, the chapter authors and uh, take the reins from uh, from that. Max, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dennis. Yeah, I'm really excited about this edited volume uh, getting published, and I'm working together with such an awesome group of scholars. Has really been a great experience. Um, let me tell you a bit about why we decided to publish this book. So a lot of governments and organizations have been talking about how important it is to have a stable cyberspace. So the EU wants to make sure cyberspace is an open, stable, and peaceful uh, and secure environment uh, when, where human rights and the rule of law applies. NATO has recognized cyberspace as a domain of operations and wants to promote, uh, quote unquote, stability. Um, you hear similar statements in the UK and the US where they will say that they're committed to promoting stability in cyberspace. And the, the notion of promoting cyberspace or cyber stability is not just a Western thing either. Uh, people in governments all over the world uh, think that having a stable cyberspace is a good idea. Now, the thing is, nobody is really sure what cyber space, uh, cyber stability really means in this context. And it's one of those terms that gets thrown around a lot, but, um, rarely defined. Um, and at the same time, implicitly, people have different ideas about it. Some use a more narrow conception, some use a broader conception. And overall, this seems something as normatively good, but rarely is it discussed how certain trade-offs are made by uh, making some elements maybe more stable and others less. Um, so this is where this edited volume comes in. We've got some of the most prominent scholars in the field writing about instability in cyberspace and what it means for cyberspace as a whole. And this book takes then uh, a hard look at the classic notions associated with um, stability, such as whether cyber operations can lead to unwanted escalation. Um, but it also addresses topics that so far have not been addressed in the existing literature at all, such as the application of a decolonial lens to investigate um, the more Euro-American conceptualizations of stability. So combined, these chapters make us really question and rethink whether in some ways cyber stability is a good thing at all, and if so, how we should think about it and uh, also implement certain policies to promote um, these aspects. So we'll now turn it over to James. We'll talk a bit more about the sections of the book and introduce the speakers. Thanks very much, Max. Uh, and just to uh, echo as uh, co-editor, this is uh, such a fantastic project to be working on and with uh, a really great group of people. Uh, and we really feel it has the potential to um, contribute uh, significantly to the broader policy conversation on, on cyber stability. Um, and of course, we've titled the volume Cyber Space and Instability um, to really focus on uh, the potential inadvertent um, uh, aspects or unintended consequences of this kind of uh, policy goal. Now, the book is split into four sections, each in turn widening the scope of analysis uh, for cyberspace and instability as the volume progresses. Um, the first 
section is on escalation, and this is uh, where classical notions of uh, stability uh, in geopolitics and in international relations come from. Uh, this section examines how cyber operations can contribute to instability, um, what role they might play uh, in increasing escalation, especially uh, between great powers. And here we'll have uh, Fiona Cunningham talking about her chapter with Ben Buchanan uh, on US-China relationships and uh, the role of uh, cyber operations uh, within that. The second uh, section uh, looks at institutions. Uh, now, there are many uh, international institutions whose stated goal is to uh, improve or preserve um, the stability of uh, the international order, uh, NATO uh, being uh, prime among them. Uh, and this section uh, takes a deep look at that policy goal of stability in relation to cyberspace. Not only seeing um, the uh, role of uh, organizations like NATO in promoting geopolitical stability, but also their less obvious role in, in trying to promote uh, technical stability uh, even beyond their member states as well. Uh, it also looks at uh, institutions within states as well as um, broader uh, international institutions. Uh, the third section uh, focuses on infrastructures, uh, especially in a um, when we're talking about a global internet, we can't talk about uh, stability uh, purely in a, a geopolitical lens. We have to talk about the wider infrastructures that enable uh, continued digital communications across the globe. And here we have uh, Mark Raymond uh, talking about uh, the uh, entanglement of the uh, cyberspace or internet uh, governance infrastructure with a whole range of other governance infrastructures um, that create often a highly complex and uh, difficult uh, navigational challenges um, for uh, achieving stability. And we, we also have uh, a chapter there on the instability of civil society in uh, as, as caused by um, these global infrastructures. Finally, as, Mark, as Max said, uh, we the last section of the book focuses on subaltern and decolonial perspectives. Uh, this widens uh, the scope of analysis still further to ask not only is cyberspace becoming more or less stable, but is it becoming stable for who, for whom? Um, who is uh, uh, the goal or who is the target audience of stability in cyberspace? Uh, Malin uh, uh, Fiddler, uh, who's here on the call, and Denswell Mumford uh, in this section examine uh, often uh, left out, marginalized or unappreciated uh, communities, uh, states and regions uh, that have an important voice and still much further to do um, in terms of uh, contributing to cyber stability. I'll turn over now uh, to the chapter authors uh, in that order. So uh, Fiona, Mark, and then Malin, uh, and then we can uh, open the floor for questions. Fiona, over to you. Thank you so much uh, to, to, to Max, James, and in absentia to Bobby as well. Good morning, good evening, uh, um, I guess good night, uh, wherever you happen to be tuning in from. Um, it's really exciting, I think, to see this project for me come together, uh, especially since I think a lot of the work we were doing during the course of the pandemic and it absolutely didn't stand in the way of bringing together, I think, a really terrific and, and thought-provoking um, edited volume that I'm very proud to be a part of. Um, so I lost my co-author, Ben Buchanan, to the White House National Security Council, um, but nevertheless, I'm very happy to try and talk on behalf of both of us about the chapter that we wrote, looking at this kind of very traditional, if you like, uh, conception of instability in cyberspace. Uh, we were worried about some of the crisis escalation risks that we um, thought could emerge uh, because of the way that uh, great powers um, spy on each other in ways that are indistinguishable from preparations for cyber attacks in our chapter. And um, my co-author, Ben, is a scholar of U.S. cybersecurity uh, matters, and I focus very much on uh, on China's um, 
a military affairs. And so we thought we would look at this uh, from the perspective of these two countries. And when we began writing the paper back in 2019, I have to say that um, I was uh, less concerned than I am now about uh, the prospects of a very serious US-China crisis occurring again, in which we might see uh, some of the, the types of dynamics that we write about in the paper occurring again. But we had in mind the kind of crisis that occurred back in 2001 when a PRC fighter jet crashed into a US EP-3 spy plane um, and the possibility of you know, what might happen in that instance if, they're, uh, if both countries were engaging in some fairly robust uh, cyber operations as well. Uh, so we were motivated to write the chapter because of what we saw as being a kind of schism between scholars and policymakers who were quite deeply concerned about US-China crisis escalation risks, who were often worried about the novelty and lack of rules surrounding cyber attacks inflaming those crisis escalation risks. And on the other hand, cybersecurity scholars who were growing increasingly, I think, skeptical that cyber attacks were posing any sort of novel escalation risks. And if anything, they uh, they um, um, sort of thought they may provide these uh, pressure valves and release valves for otherwise uh, escalatory situations. And we figured that if there was in one instance in which cyber capabilities and operations might have a kind of independent effect on state behavior that would stoke escalation risks, it would be in a great power crisis. And I think our chapter dovetails quite nicely from a terrific first chapter of the volume from Jay Healy and the late uh, Robert Jervis, which I think really tackles head on this debate over whether cyber operations are escalatory and instead kind of reframes that question, saying it's not a question of whether they're escalatory, but rather a question of when, pointing out that it's cyber operations might be able to diffuse crises when one state wants to de-escalate, but could inflame um, uh, more serious uh, geopolitical crises. So returning back to, to uh, Ben and my contribution, um, we really focused on one source of escalatory risk, which uh, is the need uh, to conduct operational preparation of the environment, or OPE for short, for most sophisticated cyber attacks. But OPE is, uh, is difficult to distinguish from sort of plain old espionage because both are requiring access to an adversary's networks and access gained for one reason can be used for another. And an adversary uh, would be quite, uh, would have quite a bit of difficulty distinguishing the intruder's intent or being sure that it wouldn't change its intent in the future should it discover uh, an, uh, uh, one of uh, its enemies sort of in its networks in the midst of a crisis. Um, so we, we sort of looked at this scenario where this feature of offensive cyber operations could lead to inadvertent escalation in a crisis if, say, the U.S. Uh, discovered that China's military cyber operators had exploited its uh, important military or civilian networks in a crisis and without the luxury of time to expel the intruders or properly investigate excuse me, um, what it is that they might be doing in there, it might assume the worst about China's intentions and use force, whether in cyberspace or in the physical world. So that was the kind of scenario uh, that we had in mind. And there are a variety of reasons that I won't go into for reasons of time why you might see that kind of reaction um, uh, occurring rather than a more or more measured one. Um, given that no US-China crisis had occurred in the age of military cyber operations, perhaps with the exception of uh, what we saw in uh, Taiwan last uh, year with uh, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit, um, we looked for evidence as we were writing this chapter that the two countries were recognizing and seeking to mitigate escalatory risks posed by their cyber operations in how they organized and how they talked about their cyber operations. Um, and our findings suggested that escalation risks would be present and couldn't be ruled out, um, in particular that the US was aware of them but tended to downplay them in its doctrine and operations, while China recognized there was this distinction problem between OPE and espionage, but really sort of overlooked its implications for crisis uh, instability. Um, and uh, inadvertent escalation risks, just generally, I would add from my own broader research, are missing in the suite of, of uh, cyber escalation risks that Chinese scholars were starting to worry about from the mid-2010s onward. So without uh, going on for, for too much longer, I do just also want to quickly add, uh, on the other hand, one could interpret our findings as indicating, look, the US is totally fine to be relaxed about these risks. It's appropriate for China to ignore them. Uh, the two countries don't really need to worry too much about aligning their views on cyber operations because they're discreet and not that damaging. So it was difficult to rule out that uh, interpretation of the evidence as well. 
but uh, we've, we we uh, erred on the side of caution, if you like. Um, and I think events in the, since then suggesting that US-China crises could be quite difficult to diffuse, as shown by the balloon incident in recent weeks, I think um, add credence to those judgments. So I'll pause there and turn it back over um, uh, to the next uh, next author or back to Jim. Thanks, Fiona. Uh, I will go uh, straight on to um, Mark. Yeah, thank you. And and let me add my thanks um, to the, the organizers of the volume and to the Hague Program on International Cybersecurity for hosting this event. Uh, really happy, as Fiona uh, mentioned, to be to be part of this fantastic group. It really is a, a really impressive group of, of folks who were also very lovely to work with throughout the project. Um, my chapter sort of, I think it, it's in the section on infrastructures, but I think it sort of straddles the sections, uh, all, all three in fact, right? Because it deals with great power issues, at least indirectly uh, in a way that I'll talk about in a minute. It is certainly about institutions and global governance arrangements. And it is also at least a little bit about infrastructures and specifically about IOT uh, or internet of things or cyber physical systems. And that was really kind of the starting point for the chapter was thinking about the implications of pervasive global adoption, not only of network computing, but also of cyber physical systems, remote sensors, remote switches, other kinds of devices, not only in consumer applications, but throughout industrial and infrastructural applications as well. That builds on an article that I wrote with Laura Artis in 2017 in the UC Davis Law Review, where we look at the global policy implications of the Internet of Things. So building on that work, what I wanted to do was really try and think carefully about, well, what does network computing as a sort of general suite of technologies mean for the stability of the international system and its institutions? And my broad approach to, to international relations is very constructivist inspired. And so for me, I think about these things in a little bit different way than uh, maybe you know scholars using other sorts of theoretical lenses might. And it occurred to me that one of the implications of really pervasive IoT adoption and network computing adoption more broadly is that it entangles or enmeshes the internet with basically everything, right? And this isn't by any means a new observation. This is something that we sort of uh, rotely note in our introductions and then move on to sort of talk about whatever specifically we want to talk about. Uh, but for me, I wanted to sort of dwell on that a little bit in this chapter and really try and center it a bit. Because I think one of the implications is that this kind of entanglement, or in, in parts of the chapter, I use a language of metastasization, so broad, rapid, systemic spread of something that changes the operation of a system, uh, obviously biological process. But for me, one of the implications, I think, is that it really calls into question the conditions of possibility that we assume when we sort of have a variety of structures, not only for global governance, but also for democratic politics at the domestic level. So for example, if democratic parliaments in countries like the United Kingdom and in Canada can't compel successfully Mark Zuckerberg to come and testify about Facebook's role in elections in Canada and the United Kingdom, which is by the way, a real scenario, right? What does that say? Both people in the United Kingdom and in Canada routinely use Facebook to consume news in ways that are mediated by Facebook's algorithm decisions and other sort of business operations choices. Um, so in a way, even our elections are entangled with internet computing. IoT deepens that entanglement in ways that are fundamentally insecure because IoT devices are commodity uh, things that have very limited security potential and are very hard to upgrade and have long life cycles and are just sort of floating out there in very insecure ways. So these sort of choices that we're making about technology then have really deep governance implications. One of the things that I think it suggests is that not only is the internet itself critical infrastructure, there is a case to be made, this is where the chapter really sort of tries to land, that we should think of the internet governance regime complex as critical governance infrastructure. That is, our other kinds of governance arrangements will not work unless the internet governance architecture and regime complex is also functional. And I think there are some very real questions about that that you know, relate not only to the complexities of that regime complex, it is massively decentralized, it is global in nature, but in certain ways, at least for critical internet resources like names and numbers and uh, standards and protocols actually relies on global uh, agreement and consensus about 
a range of technical choices that people make in product design and network operation. That's a really challenging set of circumstances. And if we make everything else depend on that, we've sort of created a, a point of failure risk, right? That one point of failure can have follow on consequences for a whole range of things that I think aren't broadly understood, or I, I don't think people have been thinking about as a risk to the stability of the international system. So for me, that's the, the sort of simple message of the chapter is that we need to think about stability in this broader sense. Uh, we need to think about it in an era of great power competition where there is increasing contention over uh, some of these internet governance arrangements and other kinds of governance arrangements more generally. And it forces us to think about the playing field for great power competition in ways that extend well beyond the traditional ways as IR scholars that we do that. We have to think about not only military crisis as Fiona and Ben do in their chapter really nicely, we have to think about uh, espionage, we have to think about uh, sort of diplomatic competition for influence globally, but we also need to think about the operation of these internet governance infrastructures as points or sites of great power competition. So that's uh, all for me, and I will turn over to Malin. Hello, everyone. Apologies for the, the lateness this morning. I live in a very snowy place in the States that still hasn't figured out how to clear snow. Um, so I was a little delayed getting in this morning. Um, thank you to all of the co-authors and the conveners. I'll jump in. I'm going to try to just give you hopefully enough information that you're interested in reading the chapter rather than the entire arguments of the chapter. So my chapter looks at cyber stability from an African state perspective. And what I want to do is show how dominant views of cyber stability actually tend to center things which African states view as destabilizing. So technological, <clears throat> excuse me, and regulatory openness interoperability, uh, internationality, all of these things, usually we say tend to foster interdependence, which uh, fosters stability. African states can view these things as fostering dependence and thus instability. And so what I've looked at is looking at two things that African states have been pursuing in the cyber realm, which from a majority perspective, are actually quite destabilizing. But what I show through my, my arguments in the chapter is that for African states, these things are actually part of a cyber stability agenda. So the two things that I uh, look at in detail in my chapter are investment patterns in cyber infrastructure and particularly in undersea cable fiber optic uh, infrastructure and the legal architecture of cybersecurity in the African continent. So first, just to say a few words about the infrastructure piece, uh, we have seen a pattern of African states demonstrating preferences for certain international investors in their undersea fiber optic infrastructure, even if that comes at the cost of sort of diversity of in investors in their infrastructure. And this preference tends to be from a decolonial perspective. So they, uh, African states are, are more apt to prefer investments from non-European powers. So that could be from American tech companies. More and more we're seeing it come from uh, places like China or the Middle East. Uh, so even though that might look destabilizing uh, from an African state perspective, um, that's actually pursuing a different kind of stability. The other thing I look at is uh, African states have turned to authoring their own rules in the cybersecurity context. We often view global international mechanisms as stabilizing mechanisms, but we saw African states do something different in this context. We saw them draft their own um, African Union Convention on Cybersecurity and Data Protection. And so I argue, again, um, this sort of carving off into their own space is actually a cyber stability enhancing mechanism for African states, even though majority states probably view that as destabilizing. So I know that's a very quick overview, but I will stop there uh, and leave room for more questions. Thanks very much, Malin. Um, and just to draw it to a close before we uh, hand over to questions and I hand back to uh, Dennis, I just want to um, draw on this uh, sort of um, more uh, substantial uh, discussion of the different chapters, just to draw together the theme um, uh, running across the book and, and across these four different sections as well. And because once we combine 
is four approaches to cyberspace and instability on escalation, institutions, infrastructures, and subaltern and decolonial perspectives. This, for us, reveals how, if the status quo is problematic, right, whether this is from the perspective of those subject to reckless or disruptive cyber operations, or those, as Malin said, who reject the dominance of some uh, states and um, people in inter internet governance, then so is the concept of stability, right? If the status quo is problematic, the concept of stability as a continuation of the status quo is problematic. Therefore, the cyber policy field urgently needs to reconceptualize instability, um, recognizing yeah, there's a balance here. On one hand, a positive orientation towards stability is, as Max started with, baked deeply into cyber policy. Um, but on the other hand, we need to continue to probe more critically at its assumptions and its consequences in order to make sure that doesn't lead us down a problematic or dangerous path. Thank you.